Hello, I'm Bob Short. This is Reflection on Georgia Politics, sponsored by Young Harris College and the Russell Library at the University of Georgia. We're very delighted, delighted today to have our guest, Mr. Norman Underwood, longtime Georgia political campaigner and expert, a former candidate himself, and now a very successful lawyer uh, in the city of Atlanta. Welcome, Norman. We are delighted, as I said, to have you here. You know, you and I are contemporaries. Uh, we came along about the same time in Georgia politics. We share a lot of friends, and uh, I'm sure that we have many, many memories that we can share. And I want to do that with you today. But first of all, I'd like to, uh, to uh, learn more about you. Tell us about Norman Underwood. Well, I'm from Gordon County. It's uh, the county seat of Gordon County is Calhoun. I grew up on a little farm out in the country from Calhoun in a community called Redbud. Redbud's not really a town. It's kind of a geographical expression, but we had Redbud High School. I graduated from Redbud High School. My father when, um, would, grew cotton and corn for the first part of um, my childhood and um, got to be a very difficult thing to make a living doing that. And, like a lot of farmers in North Georgia, we switched over to the chicken business. So um, I grew up on a combination of uh, cotton, corn, and chicken farm. And I was a 4-H club member. And I, to the extent that I ended up having an interest in politics, a lot of that's uh, due to the 4-H club. Senator Russell had a program in those years um, in the 60s in which he would invite a couple of people each year who had been in the 4-H club come up to Washington and go to college. You had to enroll at um, George Washington University or maybe Georgetown and go to school part-time. And uh, I actually went to the University of Georgia uh, on a forestry scholarship. I had uh, been the uh, National 4-H Club forestry champion and the Home Light Chainsaw Company gave me a scholarship. And so I was in the forestry school at the University of Georgia when Senator Russell's uh, assistant, uh, Bill Jordan, called and said, we've selected you if you'd like to come to Washington and be one of these 4-H club patronage workers. So I went up to Washington and I got there uh, about a week before Kennedy was inaugurated. And Senator Russell had so much uh, seniority, we were able to get very good tickets to the inauguration. And the problem that I had with the Kennedy inauguration is that I did not have an overcoat and the night before it snowed, but uh, because Senator Russell had so much clout, we had tickets and we sat right up near the uh, stage, the um, dais where Kennedy was sworn in and um, I guess the truth is that sort of gave me the political bug, just the pageantry and the, um, uh, the excitement of seeing that inauguration. Well, you know, there are very few people who really, really knew Senator Russell. Tell us about him. He was an um, <clears throat> unusual personality for politics because he was um, genuinely reserved. Uh, he had a um, low-key personality, and particularly later in life. Uh, but he became a, a student, uh, a, a genuine student. He read a lot of history um, when I was a student uh, at George Washington, I was assigned to read uh, Don Quixote, um, and I regarded that as a chore. And Senator Russell came in on a Saturday morning, and I was uh, doing my assignment reading Don Quixote. And he told me that he had read it four times. And I remember then, and still am, astounded that here's a United States senator who has read that great work of um, uh, Western literature uh, had read it four times. So uh, he was a very dedicated uh, person, was lucky to find his uh, niche. Uh, he was, uh, had the quintessential personality for being a United States Senator, namely that he could make people like him who knew him real well. Um, he was also good at retail politics or campaigning, but the truth is he never had to do much of that after he got elected. And his great strength was that um, people developed enormous respect for him. And in the United States Senate, that's the commodity that will make you powerful if your colleagues who know you well trust you. And uh, he, he was one of the 
you know, top senators uh, in history, one of the most powerful senators. Um, one of the things that um, I learned about him is I wanted to talk about world affairs. I wanted to talk with him about uh, politics and what was going on around the world. But understandably, he, all he wanted to talk to me about was baseball. So I adjusted my style to that. And um, so every time I would see him or I would occasionally drive him somewhere, I would talk about baseball and we would have an active conversation. But if I switched over and started talking about what was going on, and this was in the early years of uh, activity in Southeast Asia, and, um, he, he didn't have the slightest interest in talking to me about that, but we would talk about baseball at great length. Despite their obvious political philosophies, Senator Russell was extremely close to President Johnson. Well, S Senator Russell had a lot to do with making uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Johnson became majority leader of the Senate after less than a term, I think maybe four years uh, in the Senate. He became majority leader. And the possible way you could do that would be to have the blessing of, um, you know, the top leadership. And in this case, it was the blessing of Senator Russell. And uh, in the um, very comprehensive biography that um, Robert Cairo has written on uh, Johnson, he's he got it absolutely right. He's he's done the research, much of the re some of the research at uh, the Russell Library on the, the relationship between Johnson and Russell and explains in great detail that Johnson had had two great sponsors in his life. One was Sam Rayburn, the other was Senator Russell. But their friendship largely survived. It was a, kind of a melancholy story at the very end of both of their lives just because politics carried them in different directions. And I remember going to Senator Russell's funeral in Winder in January of 1971. Johnson was back at the ranch and um, did not come to the funeral and I always thought that was a uh, kind of a sad commentary on what had been one of the most productive uh, political friendships in, in the 20th century. So you left Senator Russell's office in, in George Washington University and attended the University of Georgia. I came back to the University of Georgia, went to law school and um, during law school um, I was in campus organizations, um, and on one occasion I met Carl Sanders. He was the governor of the state, but I didn't really know him. But uh, I had, of course, watched his campaign in 1962 when he was elected, and um, when I got out of law school in 1966, he was getting out of the governor's office and uh, decided to start a law firm, hire a couple of young lawyers, and I was one of those that he hired. And now you've grown into quite a large firm. We've um, we've grown to um, about 650 lawyers, and that's a real tribute to Carl Sanders. There, there are a lot of law firms in the country, or several law firms in the country that are uh, as big as we are, that have 650 lawyers. But they're not. I don't know of a single law firm that has grown to that size during the lifetime of the founder of the firm. So. That's quite a tribute to him. It is. I recall that 1962 campaign. Uh, it was uh, uh, Carl Sanders, a young state senator, uh, taking on a powerful force in Georgia politics, Marvin Griffin. An interesting thing happened there that I thought was of great benefit to Senator Sanders, and that was the demise of the county unit system. Do you recall the county unit system? I do. I. I learned more about it um, after it was gone, um, but I do remember it, it's, uh, it was a very interesting thing. I think about 130 of our 159 counties had um, what's called two units, and then um, several counties had uh, maybe four units, and then I think there were six counties that had six units, but the net effect of that was that the uh, rural areas absolutely controlled um, public policy in the state and it was a um, it was a sacred system and um, and the Sanders campaign uh, was the first campaign that actually uh, by the time the election was over 
um, I think the issue was settled. The county unit system had been discarded. But um, Governor Sanders always says with pride that he would have been elected under either system, uh, that uh, even under the old system, he would have been elected as it turned out. But that's, that's one of the important um, issues, uh, the elections in our history, because it sort of was a of the guard and uh, was kind of the rise of uh, more influence for urban areas and uh, kind of a different style in politics represented by Carl Sanders. And it also brought a new image to Georgia. It did. I think Governor Sanders, um, his style and the style of his um, wife, and uh, um, I think it did have a lot to do with uh, giving Georgia a different image. And, and that may be one of the uh, real talents that Governor Sanders always had. He's a person with uh, very good judgment, and I think he sort of had an instinct. He's a young man, 37 years old when he ran, but I think, looking back on it, that he had a feeling that turned out to be absolutely right and necessary, and that was that the time had come for Georgia to kind of move on from its history. We had had a politics that, um, truthfully, had always had a, a dynamic in it that um, probably can best be characterized as uh, as racial, at, um, where candidates would would try to get elected in part upon the resentments and fears about uh, the future and uh, what was unknown about um, social issues. And S Sanders kind of had a feeling, uh, looking back on it, that it was time for us to move on from that. And um, that was a, a very important um, instinct for a governor to have, to have at that period of time, particularly when governors in other states were uh, behaving in a very different way. And it kind of distinguished Georgia at a very important time in its history. And I think ultimately that's probably the great contribution that Carl Sanders made to the history of his state. He left office with an 84 percent favorable rating, which meant that he had obviously a very successful administration. Uh, do you remember some of the programs that he brought into Georgia? I think that the um, program that's probably had the most long-term significance was uh, his interest in higher education. Um, somewhere along the line, our uh, political commitment um, to higher education has slipped back a little bit. And Carl Sanders went to, uh, as a state senator, went to California, and um, this was long before we had the Silicon Valley, but they had a real focus on colleges there. Uh, John Connolly, who had been Lyndon Johnson's um, most loyal assistant, had gotten elected governor in Texas a couple of years before Sanders was elected. But Connolly was a very practical, very uh, perceptive political person. Uh, governor Sanders does not remember talking to Connolly about this, and I'm not sure he did, but he copied in effect, what Conley was doing, Conley decided that um, the best way to lift up Texas economically was to put a lot of money into the university system, and particularly the flagship university in Austin. And even now, 40 years, 40 something years later, um, that decision by Conley is having a lot to do with Texas. Around Austin, Texas, they're just a, uh, a concentration of technology, and it's because of the university. And Sanders started down that road here and um, put a lot of money into uh, revitalizing the university and uh, starting a whole series of junior colleges, as they were called then. I think um, uh, that's probably the program that's had the greatest influence on Georgia since the Sanders administration. And we'll never know if there had been a second uh, Sanders administration, we'll never know what exactly the focus would have been, but I've always thought that probably the biggest, the most unfortunate thing about there not being a second Sanders administration was that we kind of missed out on doing what Conley had done in Texas, which was to really make a, a major move with um, technical education and um, higher education, the kind of thing that Conley did in Texas that's made uh, a lot of difference around Austin. and. But that was uh, the program that I think Sanders uh, probably deserves the most credit for is his emphasis on higher education. 
the state constitution at that time did not allow a governor to succeed himself or herself. Right. Although we've never had a female governor in our lifetimes, uh, maybe we should. Uh, we will. Anyway, he couldn't succeed himself, so he decided to, to build a law practice. And that's where you, I think, became close friend, political ally of Governor Sanders. Because he hired me to be a lawyer, but um, after about a month here, um, we had three lawyers and we had lots of clients. Uh, I think Governor Sanders thought he was going to be on some boards and he was going to represent big corporations. But what he found out is that there were real people with real legal problems walking in the door. So we were extraordinarily busy and about a month into my career as a lawyer, he said to me one day, I've got to make a speech to a bar association and uh, can you write a speech? I said, well, I never have, but uh, he said, would you try? So um, I went in my office and uh, for two or three days and nights, I worked on a speech that he gave to the Bar Association. And after that, I was kind of uh, committed to, um, to that kind of work for him, doing a lot of uh, speeches. And then um, that would have been 1967. And um, we had a very busy time practicing law and he kind of evolved into the next campaign, which uh, was the campaign to be reelected in 1970. Did he, when did he make that decision? Was it early or later? Well, he formalized it later, but I think from the time he got out of the governor's office, he probably always had the feeling that there was unfinished work. And uh, I don't ever remember a time when um, there was a serious doubt that he would run again. I think there was always the feeling that uh, you know, he had other work to do, and President Johnson was still in office then, and Johnson tempted him with two or three um, jobs in the federal system and uh, asked him about being ambassador to um, some country, the Philippines or something. So I think his um, thought process was, what is the best thing for me to do? He had lots of options, but I think he always had had the notion that to go back into the governor's office and build on the experience he had would be a good thing. So in 1970, he decides to run again. His main opponent was Senator Jimmy Carter, who had lost a race for governor in 1966. Right. How did he plan his approach to that campaign? Well, I think the <clears throat> what you said earlier about his uh, approval rating, I think he, uh, I think Carl Sanders had a very high level of confidence based on the um, on those approval ratings that um, even people who had been Marvin Griffin's supporters, many of them had decided that uh, Sanders had been a successful governor. So in retrospect, I think um, there was probably a very confident feeling that I can continue the work that I've done, that um, we know that there's a lot of unfinished business. and. Uh, uh, this was a campaign in which he said, these are the things I want to do, and kind of laid it out. In the meantime, he had an opponent, State Senator Jimmy Carter, who, who came along, who uh, had uh, run six, four years earlier, and had been campaigning the entire time. And it's very important to understand that election, to understand the atmosphere that we had in 1970. We, in the 60s, we had um, a lot of progressive at the federal level social legislation. We had the Voting Rights Act and the public accommodations law. And in the history of the country in the 20th century, it's pretty clear that the 60s was a time of great movement forward. What is clear now that was less clear then is that um, underneath all of this progress, there was something of a backlash, as there, there usually is. But um, just below the surface of the Georgia electorate, there was a kind of a churning um, resentment against the progress that had been made. And Carl Sanders, because of the image he had and because of his friendship with Lyndon Johnson, who had been the president who brought about most of that legislation, um, had a vulnerability of being associated with that progress and Jimmy Carter State Senator Jimmy Carter understood that very well and 
played to it and exploited it and won the election. Bill Shipp, uh, who, as you know, is a very famous uh, uh, Georgia political uh, analyst, uh, uh, said this about the uh, Carter campaign, and I'm quoting. He said that Carter ran a campaign that was groundless and vicious. Do you think that's an adequate description? Well, it was a campaign that was vicious in the political sense. Um, Carter, even then, um, you know, could be a uh, appealing personality. So at the time, it didn't feel so so vicious, but um, you could tell that it was an appeal to um, not the better instincts of human nature. And uh, uh, there's no question that. Um, um, Senator Carter understood this backlash, understood that if he could uh, use certain symbols to um, link Carl Sanders with um, racial progress, that there would be uh, some number of people who would vote against him. And um, Carter played that, um, uh, he knew how to implement that strategy very effectively. Uh, Governor Sanders chose to take what he called the high road. Uh, he refused to respond to any of the charges uh, made by uh, uh, Senator Carter. Uh, as it turned out, don't you think that might have been a mistake? Oh, I think it probably was a mistake because, um, you know, since then we've developed um, the kind of politics that we've had that uh, characterized the 80s and the 90s and um, in the New century, but it's very much of a um, attack, counterattack politics. And Carl Sanders, uh, frankly, I think didn't think that was necessary because, uh, in his mind, he felt like that the public knew his record, and I don't believe that he thought that it was possible for anybody to distort his record as governor. And it probably would not have been. I think if um, if State Senator Carter had had to run against Carl Sanders without this um, underlying social backlash. He wouldn't have been able to beat him on the issue that he primarily attacked Carl Sanders on, which was that he had um, uh, benefited personally while being in the governor's office. And um, th there was really no substance to that. Uh, Carl Sanders was, uh, uh, ironically, didn't, didn't have much money in those days and uh, had a smaller net worth than, um, than Senator Carter, but he didn't think it was dignified to answer those charges. But I don't think that would have um, beat him. But when you combine that, the attacks on him personally and the attacks on his style, the fact that he had moved to Atlanta and he flew his own airplane and he was jogging before jogging was cool, um, if you combine that with the underlying uh, backlash against the Civil Rights Act and against um, the uh, what was seen in many ways as a um, intrusion of the federal government into the affairs of the state. Th put those two things together in exactly the right recipe and you get what, um, what was a very successful campaign by Jimmy Carter. And I think you have to say that Carter was an extraordinarily um, energetic, campaigner. Um, there are not many people who could have pulled off the campaign with the very same strategy. It's one thing to have a strategy, it's another thing to pull it off. So I think you have to give uh, Carter credit for that. He worked very, very hard. And um, when the votes were counted, he had um, done exactly what he set out to do. There was a third candidate in that race, Reverend C.B. King from Albany. He was an African-American. and. Obviously, he siphoned some votes from Governor Sanders because of Governor Sanders standing uh, in the African-American community. Uh, do you think that, that that number of votes that might have gone to Sanders would have made a difference in the, in the outcome? It could have. Um, uh, C.B. King never became a, a real broad-based factor, and it was interesting um, to watch him, though. This was the first um, African-American candidate I had ever seen, and he was a very dignified uh, speaker, and he spoke with, um, you know, almost a um, professorial uh, demeanor and used um, 
very formal language and had a very deep voice and uh, sound almost like a Shakespearean actor. And I think uh, the African American community had pride that he was running, but I don't recall that there were huge numbers of uh, votes, but he was always a presence at the uh, rallies and so forth. There was another candidate in the primary uh, who brought a dynamic to it that's unusual, and that was J.B. Stoner. Um, and Stoner was um, the last candidate of his type that uh, was absolutely unrestrained in um, his language. And I think that probably played into the kind of atmosphere that was created is that we had C.B. King talking and we'd have lots of um, forums in and, and that campaign and we had C.B. King talking in a very academic professorial way. J.B. Stoner in what can best be characterized as kind of gutter language and we had Sanders who had uh, was a familiar uh, commodity in Georgia politics and we had Carter and it was just a very um, unsettled atmosphere and the people that come out to those rallies tend to be supporters or curious people. There was a lot of uh, catcalling and uh, sort of agitation in the audience and it was a um, an unsettling time politically and it turned out when um, if you were the governor who were trying to go back in uh, that it was not a good year for incumbents. That year also, uh, well Carter of course won the election and uh, so did Lester Maddox who had been governor and stepped down to be lieutenant governor if that's a step down and they were settled with each other for the next four years. It was a very very unusual and colorful period. Yeah. Don't you think? It was. It was a, an interesting period that um, um, provided some of the most um, interesting um, anecdotes and episodes in Georgia's political history. And in some ways they, they had some things in common. They were both um, extremely energetic campaigners and Lester Maddox um, while he didn't have the same uh, perspective or education as Jimmy Carter, he had about the same energy level. And um, um, Lieutenant Governor Maddox um, was carrying on, with, when he finished the governor's office, he had a lot of time on his hands and he participated in a lot of parades. And um, it's when he really uh, perfected his technique of riding the bicycle backward. and. Uh, <laughs> What he devoted a lot of his time to was um, sort of looking to the future and it, it was pretty clear that all the time he was lieutenant governor, he had a plan to um, run for governor again, to go back into office. And uh, I don't think he knew a lot about the office of governor when he first went in, but like everybody else, he developed a taste for it and um, liked making the decisions. and wanted to go back into the governor's office in the election of 1974. And uh, a lot of his personal time, I think, was devoted to, to that very course of uh, getting back in the office in 1974. Now, this is a period that I really want to talk to you about, Norman, because one of my favorite people, George Busby, ran for governor. Uh, George Busby was a friend of yours. Uh, you were his campaign manager. Uh, you had probably the most brilliant strategical campaign I've ever seen uh, and you devised it so I want you to tell us as much as you can about how you helped George Busby defeat Lester Maddox. Well it was um, it was pretty clear that Lester Maddox was going to run again and um, it was also pretty clear to most any observer that he had a, um, a very solid lock on um, over 40 percent of the vote. I mean, you know, there was no way that anybody was ever going to keep Lester Maddox from getting 40 to 45 percent of the vote. The question was, did he have 50 percent? And, um, and the answer to that was going to depend on 50 percent against whom. And so the, the issue in the 1974 race essentially was, will there be a runoff? Will the 
the feel of candidates running against Lester Maddox be able to hold him to less than a majority? And then who will be the person to finish in second place? Along the way, though, an interesting thing happened with George Busby that um, uh, tells you uh, something about him and about ambition and about politics in general. The Speaker of the House was, uh, uh, at that time, was a man named George L. Smith, had gone back in as Speaker and was uh, in the Maddox administration, a, a dominant political force because uh, the legislature really um, began to assert itself and become an independent uh, force, and George L. Smith was a part of that. He was an institutional person. He was only 61 years old, but he had a stroke in the fall of 1973, I think, and died. And George Busby was the majority leader and um, kind of the de facto chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Sloppy Floyd was the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, but George Busby was uh, the person who had handled the budget for several years. So a lot of his colleagues um, were prepared to um, vote for him for speaker. There was another Georgian who was interested in the office of speaker. He was Tom Murphy. Um, but I remember one afternoon, uh, in shortly after George L. Smith died, George Busby called me and we met at some coffee shop. And he and I had been talking about the race for governor. And he said, I got to decide this afternoon whether I'm going to run for speaker or run for governor. And um, I remember exactly what I said. I said, well, you can get a footnote in Georgia history or you can go for the whole page. <laughs> and um, he said, I think I'll go for the whole page. And he pretty much made the decision right there in the um, coffee shop to not run for speaker, but run for governor. So we started devising a plan for for him to run for governor. Uh, George Busby was probably the perfect candidate as it turned out. All of this is much more clear when it's over, but he was probably the perfect candidate to run against Lester Maddox because he was um, likable and he had a great deal of um, specific knowledge about the operations of the state government, which Governor Maddox didn't have, even though he had been governor, and uh, George Busby was, I think, 47 years old, and he was a very uh, nice-looking person and looked good on TV. But the problem was that there was a lot of talented people running in that race. That race, uh, most people who paid attention to the politics would reach, this, reach the same conclusion, is that if you could finish in second place and get the run head-to-head -head with Lester Maddox, you would have a pretty good, you know, you'd have a chance to win. So Bert Lance, uh, very um, distinguished, uh, hard-working, appealing candidate who had been the uh, transportation, uh, is, I think then we call it the highway commissioner, or head of the transportation department in the Carter years, mm -hmm. um, ran. And he had the support of what most people would call the, the business community, the establishment, the bankers. He was a banker. The big mules they're known as. He did. And uh, in addition, George. T. Smith got in that race. Another candidate was um, David Gambrell, uh, who had been appointed to the Senate by um, Governor Carter. And in the 72 race, he had lost but still had political ambition. But here's a person of you know, very considerable ability. And uh, Bobby Rowan. All of those candidates were running in the, in the Democratic primary. And the, uh, the trick was to try to get in the, in the runoff. And um, Bert Lance had both the support and some of the liabilities now of uh, many in the Carter group. Because um, Governor Carter had um, been activist and it was not, there was a lot of benefit to being associated with Carter, but there was also some, as there always is, at the end of an administration, you know, you're going to pick up some people who didn't get appointed to what they had hoped they'd get appointed to. And so our strategy 
basically all along was to try to get one vote more than Bert Lance, and we got uh, a few more than Bert Lance, and then Busby was able to uh, be in the runoff with, with Governor Maddox. And uh, I, I remember that there was one debate, a televised debate, between Governor Maddox and, and uh, candidate George Busby. And I was still uncertain as to whether Busby was going to be able to pull this off because Maddox just had broad, broad support. But in the runoff, I mean, or in the initial election, when he didn't get the 50 percent, then, you know, you, there's a, uh, usually an assumption if you don't get to the 50 percent, it's going to be hard. But he, um, he had a real shot. And there was a televised debate. And uh, the truth is that George Busby didn't do a very good job in the debate. He was tired. He had come in from campaigning. Uh, the uh, questions were not very sophisticated. But I remember watching it, and I said, um, Busby's going to win because he looked like a governor. And Governor Maddox at this point was older. He was, um, all of his approaches were kind of, uh, Shop worn. All of his expressions were, uh, you know, well known to people. And I saw that picture of George Busby on the screen, and I said, "I think he's going to win," and he did. Mm -hmm. Workhorse, not a show horse. That was the um, slogan. That was the slogan, and it fit George Busby perfectly. And we stole it from um, uh, Sam Rayburn. Stole it from somebody. I'd, I'd like to meet the original person, <laughs> but uh, the first time I ever saw that was associated with. Um, Sam Rayburn from Texas, and uh, um, but we had a woman who uh, was working in the campaign named uh, Dot Wood, who had worked um, in the advertising agency that um, had worked on Jimmy Carter's campaign, and um, I said to Dot one afternoon, uh, "Do you think we could turn this into a campaign slogan?" And she said, "Let me try," and um, it became a very uh, well-known slogan in the campaign. Well, Maddox himself was an issue. He had he had been in uh, talk shows. He'd gone around the country, and I think that people got the impression that uh, that he was more of a showman than he was a, a political candidate. Uh, and I think you use that very effectively, Busby. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think uh, there was a the slogans work if there's a grain of truth to them, and in the in the case of Maddox, um, you know, he did get elected because he uh, he did have some showmanship. He had a lot of energy and had a lot of uh, uh, endearing personal qualities if you knew him. But um, in, in terms of the substance of being governor, he was a fairly uh, superficial. But his talent was political talent, and the public knew that. I mean, the, the common sense, the common people, as such, that they knew that. Busby came across just what he was, as uh, very honest and very competent and uh, very real, and he was the perfect candidate to run against Lester Maddox, and we'll never know, but he might have been the only, only person in Georgia that year who could have, could have beat Governor Well, he Maddox. certainly won the runoff uh, by a large margin, yeah. and he was elected governor, and then you joined his administration. I was at uh, the job that used to be called executive secretary. It's now called chief of staff. And uh, um, <clears throat> sometimes you get lucky when you think you're unlucky. Uh, the, we started into that administration, and um, there was a, a very serious economic recession that developed. So Busby's great expertise was in the budget. So he put together a budget um, that he thought was relatively conservative. The legislature went home early, I mean, went home in uh, probably early March. And then the um, revenue collections uh, bottomed out, uh, went way down. And we realized that we had budgeted more money than we were going to have. And Busby called a special session for June. And this made the reputation of George Busby because uh, what he did is what um, public officials seldom do. He took a great deal of time and explained to the public, I'm going to have to cut things that I don't want to cut. And uh, one of them was a pay raise for uh, university professors. 
and it was just a maybe a five percent pay raise but he went through um, an explanation and used a lot of expressions uh, one of the expressions was that you know I, we have to bite the bullet and such things as there's no such thing as a free lunch but it was fiscal conservatism not rhetoric about fiscal conservatism but it was managing resources and the public decided they really liked that and Busby after having a special session cutting the budget he became very very popular it was a, a phenomenal thing to see because usually it works the other way usually if you if you have to have a special session cut services um, there's a group of people that are going to be mad and they agitate against you and it was a, one of the great ironies and one of the most uh, interesting things I've seen in politics to see Busby become so um, very respected and it was primarily because he uh, this was his this was his personality but he explained with a great deal of sincerity why he had to cut these services and the public liked that and was sympathetic with it not long after that um, somebody suggested changing the Constitution to let the governor succeed uh, himself and um, it, it, that's an extraordinary thing to think about too as a sitting governor uh, usually you the legislature would when they pass a resolution a constitutional uh, amendment they would make it not applicable to the current governor but um, Busby was so well liked by the legislature and the public that um, they changed the Constitution and he ran again and served eight years let's talk for a minute or two about his uh, his programs uh, as I recall, uh, uh, Governor Busby, as, as Governor Sanders, looked very hard at uh, education, he uh, technical schools, job training, that sort of thing. Uh, and education was one of his, uh, his big programs. It was uh, Governor Busby benefited by following Governor Carter, and the state benefited by having those two governors serve back to back. The reality is that Governor Carter had started a lot of things, but um, he served one term, and I think it would be accurate to say that in the last uh, year of his um, tenure as governor, he was um, focusing on national issues. But they had created a um, mechanisms in the state government. They created such departments as the Department of Human Resources, a very big department, but um, it was in flux and um, needed a lot of management. Uh, Governor Carter had, had uh, passed a lot of environmental legislation and I, I think probably in terms of state government, that's Governor Carter's contribution to the state, is that we, we do have um, some very effective uh, environmental measures that for the early 1970s were very progressive but they needed a lot of work to make them um, work and um, so I think what Governor Busby did since he had been in the legislature and knew the state government he took what Carter had done and applied a lot of real management to it and everything kind of settled down and coalesced and uh, had to change some of it, but he didn't go change things just because it was not his. You know, he had no interest in undoing Carter's work. He, his interest really was in making it function. And um, public education is, is always one of those issues that demands the time of the governor. And um, he put a lot of um, emphasis on that, but somewhere along the line, this country boy from Albany got it in his head that what the state really needed was um, um, international investment and trade and um, so he developed a genuine interest in um, trade missions and sort of selling the state and he became, um, a, th there's so much involved in life and in public service that's just kind of accident of time but um, Early in Busby's administration, there was a, an event at Callaway Garden. It was called the Persian Weekend, and the ambassador from Iran was there. The Shah was still in power. I'm not sure Busby had ever met anybody. I'm sure he'd never met anybody from Iran, and he, he had dealt with very few foreign people in his life. And he had me call Dean Rusk 
because he was going to have to go down and do a toast to the ambassador from Iran. And this person had been in the paper a lot. He had dated Elizabeth Taylor, and uh, so everybody knew who he was. And Mr. Russ came over and told Governor Busby how to conduct himself in the presence of an ambassador, propose a toast, and um, you know, sort of went through the protocol. And that was the first Busby exposure to um, somebody from another country. And he liked it because he, uh, the same skill that makes people like you in the legislature will make foreign people like you. And that really was the beginning of his interest in um, exposing Georgia to um, foreign business people and became a real centerpiece of his um, administration. And ultimately probably was his great contribution was to kind of open up the state to trade. And now we've got you know one of the biggest, probably the most active ports in the country. And uh, a lot of that came because of Busby's work around the country uh, selling the state. And international banking, and and an inter international airport. Right. So he did a tremendous job with the trade. But you left the administration before its end, and I became went, a judge. I became a judge, and um, was on the court of appeals, and uh, it's a wonderful job, a wonderful court. I was um, young, and I had been in um, in the governor's office, which is a very uh, intense daily. Job so being on the court was a was a um, quiet job and you in that job you have a lot of time for thinking and uh, probably too much time for reflecting and so we were coming up on 1980 and um, I, a, a very interesting thing happened Carter by this time had become president Carter made the famous speech in the late 70s about the malaise in the country you know. Um, uh, about the discontent that um, was felt by so many people. And um, that was absolutely true as you approach 1980. You could tell that people were just kind of not satisfied with what was going on. Carter called it a malaise. You could call it whatever you want to call it. But Herman Talmadge was going to have to run for the reelection to the Senate. And um, since I had a lot of time on my hand, I would talk to people. I'd go to if I was in the barber shop, I'd talk to people about the, how they felt about public policy in the country and Senator Talmadge. And um, a very interesting thing I observed was that almost everybody said, um, well, Herman Talmadge will be reelected. There's no doubt about that. But I'm not going to vote for him. And what I sensed was that um, there was just a feeling that we're going we're gonna to move on. You know, there just needs to be somebody different. So I said, um, you know, I'm young and I'm over here on the court and um, if I'm going to have to run for something, I'd have to run uh, for judge. I said, yeah, I think I'll go run against Senator Talmadge. Problem was, Zell Miller had the same idea in Dawson Mathis and um, the sense that I had that it was going to be a year of um, change turned out to be right, although not exactly as I had envisioned it because ultimately as we know uh, the Republican nominee, Mac Mattingly, uh, did um, capitalize on that very thing that I'm talking about, sort of the discontent with things as they were, kind of an instinct to change the guard. And Mac Mattingly uh, got elected in 1980, and that was kind of the beginning of the rise of the modern Republican Party in, in Georgia. Did you and Zell Miller ever discuss the race before you entered? I think we may have um, talked a little bit, you know, the way um, people do. I think I probably called him and said, are you serious about this? And um, um, we didn't have any uh, formal, substantive discussions about it. but. Uh, because I was hoping that he wouldn't run. Dawson Mathis had already said he was running. Dawson was hoping I wouldn't run. And, uh, but I think uh, all three of us sort of had the same idea. I mean, he articulated in a different way. But, and I think Zell was at this point in his life, he, he was lieutenant governor. And um, I think the, the amendment to the Constitution had, 
had um, probably been a little bit of a jolt to him because he, he had been elected lieutenant governor and he never told me this, but it's rational to assume that he had planned to run for governor and so they amend the constitution. So um, here there's not going to be another governor's election until 1982 and we're right in the middle of this and um, so Zell had a um, had an interesting approach in that race. It was kind of an, uh, uh, an attack mode that he was in and it it turned out that the way people felt about Senator Talmadge was not, they were not mad at him. You know, there was not much uh, resentment against Senator Talmadge. There was just a feeling that it was time to move on, that the Talmadge era was over. And Zell um, played that a little differently and attacked Talmadge. And there was kind of a, um, I think, a backlash against that. So Talmadge was able to win that race, whereas Mattingly, did almost nothing with Talmadge. I mean, he, you know, he, he was just uh, running and um, not nearly as uh, focused and articulate as Zell Miller. The, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that happened in 1980 that's uh, interesting when we, we look back on it, um, uh, Zell Miller, Lieutenant Governor Zell Miller, finished in second place in the runoff with Senator Talmadge, and Senator Talmadge won. And it was a uh, brief but intense runoff, and it was a very disappointing um, uh, experience for the lieutenant governor. But I think, looking back on it, my observation, he's never uh, told me this, but my observation is that this was one of the most important uh, periods and probably one of the most educational things that Zell Miller ever had, and I'm pretty sure that he would not have been nearly as effective uh, as a governor had he not gone through this disappointing time as a result of the 1980 race. And um, I know that he uh, <clears throat> he got angry with me because uh, in a uh, fit of alliteration, one time I referred to him as Zigzag Zell, and um, that kind of thing was. Uh, uh, did not go down well with him at that time. He was he, he had a hard time uh, with uh, criticism at that stage in his life and in his career. But he was always very civil and very courteous to me, even in the campaign context. And he didn't have to attack me because he was much better known than me. It would have been bad strategy for him to attack me back. So I just attacked him uh, with impunity, as we would say. But after the race was over. Um, I would see him for a few months and he was kind of, he was always cordial, but he was kind of formal. So years went by and we get, we're coming up on um, 1990, this would have been in 88 or 9. He called me one morning and wanted me to meet him for breakfast at a hotel and uh, it was one of the most interesting conversations I ever had with a public figure because he said, you have seen me at my worst, but I want to run for governor, and I want to—I want you to help me, and I want to be a different kind of candidate this time. And um, I, I knew right then that he probably was going to win because he had himself, not some consultant, but he had himself analyzed what went wrong and analyzed his own personality and realized that he had had an edge in that uh, 1980 campaign and he took it too seriously and uh, he had not had the support of the business community. The business community was not comfortable with him then. He had figured out that he needed the business community and he was uh, taking an entirely different approach and that approach carried him to um, the uh, win and then carried him through the uh, election, uh, I mean, through his administration and made him, uh, you know, one of the most effective governors we've ever had. But I'm pretty sure that a lot of that uh, effectiveness went back to the disappointment he had in the 1980 race when we had a free-for-all to try to get to run against Senator Talmadge. And of course, it turned out to be the frustrating thing about that from my standpoint is that 
what I was sensing uh, as we approached 1980 turned out to be right. I mean, it was a time of great change. It was a changing of the guard, and I didn't, I had no idea that Ronald Reagan would wind up being elected, but that was the effect of it. The, the melees, the uh, discontent that I was getting from people in the barber shop when they were telling me that they were not going to vote for Herman Talmadge, but they were pretty sure he was going to win. That discontent turned out to be nationwide, and Ronald Reagan was elected, and that was the beginning of the so-called Reagan Revolution. So it was a, a very pivotal year in our political history. Uh, Norman, it's always fun for people like you and me who enjoy politics and campaigns to look back. And uh, I've looked back several times at that election between Senator Talmadge and Mac Mattingly, which Mattingly won. Uh, surprisingly, uh, and I, I observed that Talmadge totally ignored his opponent, and I think that is a mistake. Well, it was a mistake then because that was a part of Senator Talmadge's um, persona and image at that point in his career, uh, as it turned out, and you could tell that early on, that um, people who didn't know Senator Talmadge, we had a lot of people in Georgia who had moved here from uh, all around the country. And they knew that uh, the Talmadge family had been a part of Georgia politics for decades, but they saw this senator who did not put a lot of energy into his uh, campaigning, and it was very easy for them to, s to have the feeling, not of any disrespect or lack of um, affection for Senator Talmadge, but just a feeling that it was time for a change. And um, that I think that's what Mac Mattingly benefited from that Zell Miller didn't get the benefit of uh, because Zell attacked Senator Talmadge and it, it was a little bit of a feeling that here is uh, Zell with these sharp pointed attacks on uh, on this senator who's been a part of a family that served Georgia for decades, and it didn't quite work, and Manningly did nothing, and a majority of the people in the general election, including all those people who had moved down here and voted Republican, decided to vote for, against Talmadge. And when they voted against Talmadge, Mac Manningly got elected. Then came 1982. By this time, I had done uh, a lot of campaigning, and um, I knew people all over the state, so I said, well, I might as well run for governor. But again, we had a lot of people, uh, a lot of very talented people uh, in that race, and, and uh, once again, the trick was to try to get into a runoff, and um, the thing that happened that uh, had such a, a bad consequence for me was that uh, Jack Watson had been um, in Washington, and Jack was um, had been in Atlanta. He was from Arkansas, but he had he knew a lot of people in Atlanta and knew a lot of the same people I did. And uh, so he came down and got 11% um, of the vote, and that left uh, Joe Frank Harris had pretty much North Georgia, um, and Bo Ginn had um, been a good congressman, an uh, energetic congressman, and um, so they were in the runoff, and uh, Jack Watson and I split the vote that uh, I contended with my vote in the, around Atlanta and with uh, people that, in our group and our age group. But Joe Frank was probably the right candidate for that period of time. There was um, there was kind of a feeling that we'd had a lot of government after Carter and Busby, and Joe Frank had been in the legislature, and he was a little bit like Busby. I mean, he was uh, kind of a low-key personality in the legislature, and that had worked out well. And uh, so, you know the. You're fortunate in politics if you can run when your personality type is the one that's needed. And um, Busby was absolutely the right personality type, even though Bert Lance would have been a, a very effective governor, I mean, a very talented person. And um, I think uh, Joe Frank was probably the right personality type for that time. Uh, somebody told me one time that uh, I was making a speech in um, um, Gainesville or somewhere, and, and somebody said, you know, we we don't have that many problems. You know, that uh, they just didn't didn't want to hear that much about it. Yeah. <clears throat> it's hard to find your niche when there's a no big number of candidates. And there are a lot of people, and uh, yeah. one of the things that I 
that is interesting when you look back on politics is that there are little moments that happen in campaigns that uh, you can sort of tell this had real significance. And this goes back to 1980, but um, I've thought about it for all these years, and it's a, a moment in time when I, I realized that this was in the summer, it was, this would have been in uh, July or August, and most of the feeling then was that Carter would be reelected. Uh, it's hard to beat an incumbent president. But I was making a speech in um, either Ringgold or um, well, it was a North Georgia town, and it was to one of these small civic clubs, like an optimist club or a Lions club or something. There were only about 20, 25 people there. But not very long before that, we, we had the hostages in um, Tehran, and um, President Carter and the military had had an operation to try to rescue the hostages, and they sent some helicopters uh, across the desert in Iran um, to try to rescue them. And they ran into storms, and the helicopters crashed. So I was making a speech in um, this little optimist club, and um, I got finished and I said, you know, anybody got any questions, any comments or anything? And I had been saying, you know, there were some things wrong. And there was one guy stood up and said, uh, we can't even get three helicopters across the desert. And everybody applauded. You know, this was a direct criticism of the United States military. And everybody in that little civic club applauded. And uh, somehow that just was a jarring thing. And I said, you know, President Carter is going to lose because if you've got people like this applauding the idea that, um, you know, our performance is just not good, and that turned out to be right. So you have these little moments that come up in campaigns when you think back on it that are, you know, are highly significant. Did you devise a strategy for your race for governor? being the strategic guy you are? Well, <clears throat> the problem that, that I had was that um, I couldn't say too much about how the state was messed up because I had <laughs> contributed to the status that it was in. So my strategy was to summon the state to a higher ground, to say that we need to go in this direction and to try to make the point that um, the caliber of the public uh, service and the, the quality of the government and the decisions that are made with the budget um, have a lot to do with um, where the state goes. And I think as it turned out, and my idea was to uh, just outwork everybody to go to every single county to meet a lot of people. And that had been a, a workable formula uh, in previous elections, but at this time, I mean, we can look back and see that we were sort of making the transition to the television age, but I didn't have enough money to do television. But Joe Frank did some television ads, and um, Bo Ginn did television ads, that, and, and I did some television ads, but there was not one galvanizing issue, and there seldom is in a governor's race. Um, Zell Miller, in 1990, came up with the wow. perfect issue with the lottery. But in a governor's race, um, there is seldom one issue because what a governor does in the final analysis is do the budget and uh, make recommendations for economic development. And everybody knows that's important, so you can't just say that all of this is important. And there was not a galvanizing issue on behalf of anybody in that race. And I, I think Bo Ginn uh, was a very popular congressman, but he, it was very difficult to translate that into uh, statewide um, popularity and Jack Watson was touting his um, experience in the White House and I was touting my experience in the state capitol and it, uh, we, we also had Buck Melton and um, some real qualified people running. So you no longer sought public office but you remained involved in politics and as I recall Governor Miller and uh, uh, attorney General Bowers tapped you to be the uh, attorney for the lottery, which was big, Zell Miller's big, big issue and, and big, big program. I did. It's a, there's a lot of work when you uh, start um, a, a lottery. And uh, the interesting thing about that is that um, 
Governor Miller himself made virtually all of the policy decisions, and they, they turned out to be really effective decisions. And what happens in most lotteries is that uh, uh, when the funds from the lottery are earmarked for education, the legislature sort of subtracts that from what they otherwise would appropriate for education and then uses that money for something else so that you don't really get that much of a boost to educational spending. And um, Governor Miller came up with a mechanism to uh, to prevent that and came up with a program, the Hope Scholarship Program, one of the most uh, acceptable and one of the uh, best public policies that we've ever had in the state. But I um, took very seriously the responsibility of working with the Attorney General to um, make sure that you know, the lottery was um, legally uh, sound, that it was started in the right way. And we had a lot of um, uh, turmoil at first because uh, in the lottery business there are a lot of people who want to administer the lottery and they play hardball and they come in with a lot of lobbying. And so uh, I told the gov uh, Governor Miller, you know, I will do every single thing I can to make sure that it's uh, everything's above board and it's worked out that way. We've, we've had a, a very good administered lottery all of these years. And it's made money. It has been uh, very effective in uh, funding particularly the Hope Scholarship. Well, I know that, that uh, ex-governor, ex-senator Miller holds you in very high regard and I think that his appointing you as chairman of his judicial uh, selection committee, commission, is that the title? Yeah. During a time when there were federal lawsuits and uh, is, a, is, is proof that he has great faith in your ability. Uh, do you remember that case? The Brooks case? Yes. Yes. The, um, uh, the way judges are selected in Georgia is that when there's a vacancy, the governor makes the appointment and the, the judge runs in the next election. And some people uh, brought a case, Tyrone Brooks brought a case, and the United States Justice Department joined in the case contending that um, that system was unconstitutional because it did not give African-American voters uh, a fair shot at electing African-American judges. And there were years went by that uh, the appointment of, of judges was enjoined. And when Governor Miller was elected, there was a, a backup. There were a lot of vacancies. And he called me and said, would you take this on and let's try to come to grips with this. So, and he said, I would like to see the courts um, fairly represented. And we set out on a, um, uh, a strategy of identifying very qualified African-American lawyers who could become judges. And ultimately the case went away. It was a, um, a very uh, uh, important piece of our history, and I think when um, Zell Miller's legacy is fully uh, evaluated, one of the important things he did was to bring diversity to the bench. I mean, we're a state with uh, uh, probably 25 or 28 percent of our population is African American. We had virtually no judges. And if you're a young man who's being sentenced for crack cocaine possession in DeKalb County, and you look at the bench and you see all white judges, no matter how good they are, and they were very good judges, but it's hard for you to have confidence in that system. And we were fortunate, Governor Miller was fortunate in that uh, at this point in our history, there were a lot of um, both women and African American uh, men who had gone to law school and they had years of seasoning and uh, earlier governors didn't really have that uh, option because the pool of qualified um, lawyers to be judged that were minorities and women uh, was a much smaller pool. And um, Governor Miller, we, we have the most diverse judiciary in the country and, and one of the best. And um, Governor Miller gets a lot of credit for that. And I was very uh, honored and pleased to, to have a part in that, to work with him and bringing that about. And I'm very proud of um, his work and that I helped him do uh, in bringing diversity to the bench. Let's talk for a minute about party politics. Uh, 
in recent years, the Republican Party has completely taken over control of Georgia's state government. What happened? Well, I think Lyndon Johnson had it right. Um, Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act and said, I have uh, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act and said, I've just given the South to the Republicans. And I think that's exactly what happened. Um, suddenly they were, um, not suddenly, but in a relatively brief span of time, we went from having no African-American public officials and uh, to having a lot of African-American public officials. And um, <clears throat> people are very wise about politics in the uh, uh, Nixon administration and then uh, in the Reagan administration. People in the Justice Department figured out that you could um, do God's work by having a strategy to make African-American votes count uh, in redistricting, and the practical effect of that would be that you wind up with white districts and you're certain to get uh, white candidates. So we, we stopped having the kind of compromise that had always characterized our politics in the South because uh, before this period of time, if you were in the legislature or the Congress, you served a district that had a lot of African Americans a lot of uh, conservative, probably farm people up until the uh, real growth in uh, urbanization. So you had to be like Phil Landrum and uh, John Davis and the people that we had in Congress, a, a moderate, a compromising sort of uh, candidate. But the Republican Party, to their great credit, figured out if you have white districts and black districts, then you can be very ideological. And they do the arithmetic, and there, uh, there are a lot more voters in our state who are conservative in uh, orientation. And they did the, um, the did the analysis and the hard work, and they have ended up um, in solid control at the congressional level and at the state level. And it's a it's a product of all of those policies, but the fundamental policy that headed us in that direction was the Voting Rights Act, which produced a um, sort of a division that, uh, has, that the Republican Party has been able to uh, use very effectively. And I'm, I think you have to give uh, their political operatives credit for recognizing that, and the Democratic Party probably was slow in recognizing that until it was pretty much done. And um, in some states, North Carolina is a good example where the state went pretty much Republican and then you get the follow-up, um, uh, you, you get Democrats who had let that happen get, get very energetic and active and then they sort of reverse that trend and North Carolina now has a, has a Democratic governor. And it'll be, we'll end up with a competitive two-party system, but right now the Republicans are very much in control. Some disenchanted Democrats think the state party relies too heavily on, uh, on uh, African-American votes and labor support. Uh, do you think that uh, is a factor in losing? I think it is. Um, I think this, the uh, state party has not... Uh, been able to keep at the forefront uh, what we used to call the moderate uh, Democrats, I mean, George Busby types, maybe Zell Miller types, and uh, uh, <clears throat> but the Voting Rights Act is, is what has brought that about. We've got a very large African American delegation and um, they have become more familiar with the legislative process, they assert themselves more, they make more speeches and it's just a natural process that the, the Democratic Party gets more identified with people who are in the party, who are taking high profile positions and speaking. And I don't think anybody sat down and said, we're gonna be the party of uh, African Americans and labor, but uh, it just evolved that way. And what we did not do is we didn't have a strategy to say, well, what about all of the uh, small business people that um, are not country club Republicans and 
what the Republican Party did was figure out that um, they were not going to achieve this dominance with the traditional country club profile, and they used the social issues, the so-called wedge issues, the uh, um, abortion rights and, and all of those issues that appealed to the conservative instincts in the South, and they've kind of uh, emerged as a dominant force because of that, because they've learned to use those, those wedge issues and those social issues. Whereas historically, as uh, at the grassroots, meaning the uh, country club grassroots, uh, they were dependent on economic issues, and, um, and the Democrats always uh, beat them on those issues. But when they got to the social issues, they couldn't. Most states require party registration. We don't. Should we? Probably not. Um, I think in the South, they're just kind of a um, independence or, a, you know, a lot of the voters um, uh, would have the orientation that I'm going to vote Republican this year, but um, I don't know about next year, and I want the discretion and the uh, freedom to go vote in that other primary if I want to. And uh, I think that's kind of a independent streak that goes with us. It's, uh, so I, I think our history will probably not um, make it very good politics ever to advocate that. You had a wonderful career in law and in politics. As you look back over that career, what is your biggest accomplishment? Well, I think the, uh, the, the thing that I'm going to be proudest of for uh, probably the longest period of time is uh, that I think will have the biggest impact is working with um, Governor Miller on the um, judicial appointments and kind of heading the, the judicial system in a different direction because uh, that has real implications for the state and uh, most states would like to have a judiciary that's as diverse as ours. So that was a very uh, significant uh, development that Governor Miller gets all the credit for, but I'm very proud to have had a role in that. And then the um, worked with George Busby, and George Busby was just such a uh, um, pleasant and um, appealing person to work with. And then my longest uh, association has been with Carl Sanders, a person who started the uh, state in the direction, and he has been um, uh, my mentor as a law partner and, um, and undoubtedly the uh, single biggest figure in my life outside of family. So. I'm very proud to have made that association, to have had his respect during all of the years as uh, we have worked on um, political issues and legal issues and um, developed some uh, new law and some things that will uh, last longer than um, me and our law firm, and that's a source of real satisfaction to have had those relationships. Your biggest disappointment? Well, at the time, the biggest disappointment was um, not being able to uh, succeed on what I thought was a successful plan in, the, in 1980, because um, I think I did uh, have the right idea, and uh, I was not able to implement it, and it turned out that it was a year of change. I thought somebody new was going to get elected, and I was hoping it was me, and when you're um, at that age, um, you know, that's disappointing for a while. But um, you get over those sorts of things, and all of those experiences uh, I've been able to, to use. And um, one of the things that I got out of that is after the, um, after the 1982 campaign, I had a lot of time on my hand because I'd been out you know, making speeches. So I developed uh, uh, some habits of reading with a lot more seriousness and in depth. And so I would read uh, 20th century history, and I would read about uh, the political developments, and um, having done that, it became very um, familiar to me. And to read about the um, the New Deal and what Roosevelt was going through, and to recognize the politics that he had to implement, having worked in the Capitol, and um, you know, I could relate to having you know putting those coalitions together. And um, I would read about um, the campaign of 1960 and. Um, the role of money in the West Virginia primary, for example, well, having been a candidate and understanding um, 
that you have that walking around money, you know, that was all very familiar to me. So the backdrop of having uh, a, a participated in politics has made the uh, last 25 years of reading uh, 20th century American history uh, very exciting and enjoyable for me that I would have totally missed out on it. I not participated in politics. Another experience that um, that you only have in politics in, in our state and in our city in particular is you would not go to African American churches if you were not um, participating in politics, unfortunately. I mean, the, it's often said that Sunday morning, 11 o'clock is the most segregated time in America, and I think that's true. But when, um, when I think back on uh, my participation in politics, I've had the experience of going to uh, African American churches and seeing what the, what the role of the church is in the community and to uh, get to know the uh, prominent ministers that's a an interesting uh, experience to relate to politics but had I not been a candidate I never would have had those uh, experiences and the, the other thing about being a candidate it does force you to get to know yourself and uh, and the reality is that um, retail politics the things that you need to be really good at just to enjoy small talk to actually enjoy just going to cocktail parties uh, that that's not something that did I particularly enjoy just the um, campaigning part and um, so you finally when you go through a campaign it forces you to be brutally honest about yourself and uh, that's one of the benefits I got from campaigning was to get to know uh, what I like and what I don't like in a, in a way that's more honest than most people ever have to confront I can assure you that this is, has been totally unintentional, but we have not talked about the Underwood family. Are there any politicians growing up in the Underwood family? My, uh, my children, I've got two, um, two boys who are now in their late 30s and a daughter, and um, they have been exposed to politics and they have a reasonable interest in it, but they also see from uh, all of my involvement in uh, in my campaigns and from knowing Governor Sanders and knowing Governor Busby, uh, they they have a clear understanding of the trade-offs and the cost. And uh, we work very hard at uh, showing them the, uh, the values of family life. And I think their intuitive judgment is that um, it's not a good uh, trade-off for them. They've, um, they, they have not uh, both spent some years in Washington and my son worked for some period of time in uh, Senator Nunn's office so he's had a good experience in politics but they they work in corporate America rather than politics. Final question. How would you like to be remembered? I, I think I'd like to be remembered as somebody who um, uh, approached the um, the idea of public service with some seriousness and uh, worked hard at it and and um, developed some skills at it and, um, you know, made some small contribution to the state that, uh, you know, left it better than, than we found it. Well, Norman Underwood, on behalf of Young Harris College and the Richard Russell Library at the University of Georgia, I thank you very much.